talk about the technological singularity. And I assume from 101 it means this is the basic lesson. So, up to you, Adam. Ten, ten minutes. Cheers. Thanks for organising this, by the way. Uh, I, I trust it's been a great, great two days so far. We've got um, uh, an extra addendum future day afterwards, so I hope you can all come to and uh, bring your ideas along with you. But today I'll just be talking about um, what's called a technological singularity. And this is just really a basic um, instructional uh, talk, and it's not really a call to action. But so what we need to understand is what, uh, what AI is today, that the narrow um, applications of AI that we have today, and what it could become if we could develop AI that sort of worked similar to the way we think, in a general way. So um, narrow AI is defined as something that can accomplish, like, accomplish uh, small narrow tasks, but do it really well often. Um, like we, we just had uh, last year Watson beat the pants of um, the best uh, quiz show Jeopardy players. Uh, so we can see applications of artificial intelligence, um, sort of the waterline seems to be creeping up and they're getting better and better. So um, what's going to happen in the future if we develop AI that is able to think not only within its narrow um, expertise domain but across domain? So what would, it, what would it be able to do if it, like us, could think symbolically and take learnings from one particular domain of thought and implement those or cross-pollinate those with other, uh, other uh, domains of thought or other expertise or other areas of um, ex expertise? So we got some examples. Uh, Deep Blue um, in the 90s beats Gary Kasparov at chess. And that, um, that was a, a, quite a surprise to a lot of people, and as was Watson earlier last year. So, so but general, we have, we have a sort of a, a general intelligence. We can think, we can take one area of learning, we can take, we can learn chess, and we can apply sort of what we've learned from chess and apply that to checkers. But a, a, a computer specifically designed to think about chess wouldn't be good at playing checkers unless it was reprogrammed to do so. So, I mean, should we really take AGI or artificial intelligence seriously? Um, people have been sort of commenting that it's just around the corner for, for quite a long time. But what's different today? What have we got today that we didn't have in the 70s or the 80s? Mobile phones, <laughs> for instance. These things, I mean, Moore's law has gotten, has, uh, has increased so much and has kept pace for such a long period of time that it's, um, it's, it's not a given that it will continue like into the future, but we can see that um, the effects of Moore's Law uh, have taken computers out of uh, big rooms um, from CIRAC, the size of CIRAC. Have you seen CIRAC in the Melbourne U Museum, that's huge, right? These are uh, a million times smaller and thousands and thousands of times more powerful, okay? These are getting smaller and more powerful. I just saw on the internet today that um, we're having Linux on a thumb drive that's powered by 1.2 gigahertz processor with a gig of RAM and with um, amazing graphical capacity as well. So computers are getting faster and, uh, and smaller um, but are we d developing the algorithms for intelligence that are more efficient than we had in the past? You, yes, we are, because um, we could take an artificial intelligence algorithm that uh, we had in the early 80s um, and run that on a super supercomputer today, and that wouldn't be as efficient as an algorithm that was developed today running on the Apple IIc of the early 80s. So, yeah, we've got, we've come quite, quite, uh, we've, we have progressed in developing AI algorithms, I think we've made significant differences. And we're also using it, we're using AI um, in uh, bank transactions, in routing internet traffic, and um, in uh, providing uh, sort of medical services, determining what's the, what, what's the most likely cause of um, a particular symptom people are having, and, and what, what diseases that might, um, indicate they have. 
So, yeah, so what, what we're having, well, just another reason to take it seriously is an appeal to authority. <laughs> Because not all of us can be neuroscientists, and not all of us can, um, you know, have the time to read the, um, the, the deepest tomes in this particular uh, field. But we've got people like Terry Sanowski, who's a, a pretty big call to authority. And like I hate to rely on call to authorities, appeal to authorities on their own, um, but I think that they're fine to use to support an argument. Um, and Terry Sanowski is one of the most renowned neuroscientists. He came to speak at Australia just last year. Um, and uh, his, he said that um, reverse engineering the brain is within reach. In fact, he packed out one of the, the big um, auditoriums at, at the uh, Melbourne Conference Centre. So that was amazing. I think there were thousands of people there to watch him. So Justin Ratner is say, saying that um, we are making steady progress towards uh, um, Ray Kurzweil's singularity. And Justin Ratner is, of course, the CTO of Intel. They've um, put the, the singularity or something like it um, on their predictions in the future and a, a sort of planning for it. So what about the term, the technological singularity? Where did it come from? Okay, Verna Vinge, who is a famous author, um, said that within 30 years we'll have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. Shortly thereafter, the human era will be ended. That's, he said that in 1994. Um, timelines aside, um, Verna Vinci had a, a quite a rich description of what the singularity was back then, um, actually in the 80s. He wrote for an, uh, an Omni magazine, and uh, um, I think that was in 19, uh, 1983 that was published. But this, this quote was published in 94. So, so what, is, what, what is the metaphor of the singularity? Okay, so if you take a black hole, and a singularity is, a, is that point at which light escapes into the black hole uh, and won't come back out. So we don't know what's, what's going on inside a black hole because it's very hard to measure. Um, it's very hard to measure what a superintelligence would think of at our current levels of intelligence. We had an, uh, um, an intelligence that was architecturally different from ours and had a lot more horsepower and could think a lot more globally than ours. Um, imagine a, a, like an AI that could have a, a massive global understanding of uh, science and physics. What would it think? And could cross-pollinate its ideas from different domains. What would it be able to think? You see, w w we can um, learn quite a few things in our life, but we, we cannot just download Wikipedia and learn it by just absorbing it. We have to actually read it over and over again. Uh, what we need to, um, what, what we're interested in so we can learn. I mean, it's, a, it's an arduous process um, and we, would, we wouldn't be able to do it as quick as we are today without the use of technology anyway. Accelerating change. Um, this is a, a Kurzweil's idea um, and he, he's suggesting not that the singularity is the, singu uh, the accelerating change but we've seen accelerating change in technology and that's an indicator um, that we are, are building the resources, at least the hardware resources and the intellectual resources to make a singularity plausible. Okay, so two minutes. That's, his, that's one of his graphs. So the intelligence explosion is um, the third flavour of the singularity um, and that's the last one that I'll talk about. I.J. Good, uh, quite a well-known mathematician, uh, said that let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of such a machine is one of those intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. Okay? There will then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, he calls it, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind, and his indicating that it will be the last invention we need to make, which has some implications, like uh, if we don't need to invent anything anymore, what sort of utility, what value can we bring? Uh, what utility can we provide society if we've got computers and technology doing it all for us? That's a thought, I'm just going to leave it out there. So um, yeah, I'll just leave it there uh, with the last point is um, approaching a singularity. It may seem like um, there's nothing there, but once well, there's not much that can be seen that's very evident of a singularity happening. Um, but once it starts, it'll be very quick. It's kind of like once you push um, push a pen or, or push a, a seesaw past a certain 
uh, gravitational point, it'll quickly pull down, pull itself down. So, okay. Is there any questions? No. Oh, one, one, one last thing one. question. Sure. I know an awful lot of intelligent people, very mm. super intelligent people, mm -hmm. who have a very hard time with um, interacting with others and the emotional aspect mm -hmm. of things. Um, so in some ways, as, as much as this is, has huge, fantastic benefits, mm -hmm. um, I would also pose that a similar thing could be said about um, a machine that, that lacks any sort of connection to the, the richer part of the, the conversation that we're also having here, which is the integration of all the elements not just the economics or the sure. science or the factual side of things. So what could happen is, um, it's very hard to uh, know how um, an artificial intelligence will grow and, and where it will yeah. learn. But one thing about intelligence, intelligence is often uh, referred to as book smarts, that is the ability to read a complex mathematical pattern and, and understand it, but often it doesn't mean um, you know, the ability to socially interact. But I would ask, does our um, ability to interact with other people and our ability to um, courage and, um, and, and our emotions, do they actually come from any other part of the body other than our brain? They all come from in here. It's all, it, it's all intelligence. It's all pattern recognition. Yes? There is one element I disagree with. They don't all come from here because this is all pre-programmed by our experiences. It's got to come from here. This here is a missing in... You, you're, you're referring to the heart, right? referring to the heart but I'm referring to the greater energy that's in this universe and we're all part of it. Okay, there, there's actually nine intelligences. I think this, this uh, is one but there are lots of others. I mean, well, I argue if, 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 if we were to take, um, if we were to, if we, if, we, if we were God, right, and we could see the complete design space of intelligence, we might operate in just a small tiny speck, okay, in that mind design space. That's a small tiny speck. If we created an AI, just an arbitrary AI, we might be pulling out a piece of intelligence from this mind design space, not knowing how it will actually operate. We may not feel, or it may not act intelligent, but actually, who are we to decide what the whole like um, design space of intelligence are? We only really can see what intelligence is from our own angle. I mean, we can philosophize about it, we can do many things, but Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, is this your flash drive?